Okay, good morning, everyone. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Yep. And if, okay, thanks. Okay, so let's, uh, as we wait for everyone to join, let me start with, uh, well, our topic today is neural networks, but let's start with some administrative things. Hopefully you know everything already, but just to make sure uh, homework three is due today. Um, homework four is out today. That will be uh, focused on neural network and a little bit on uh, Bayesian learning, which is our next topic that we'll do next week. So you cannot do everything uh, as of today. One important thing uh, is the recitations this week are going to be devoted to introducing you to Python with neural networks. Uh, so if you haven't done that uh, at all, I highly recommend that you go. Go to office hours and, and consult the TAs on, on, uh, on this. This is going to be necessary uh, for the homework. Um, okay, I already talked about this. I'm hoping this is not repeating in the next in few homeworks. We did see problems in homework one and two. Um, and I want to remind you about the project. So most of you already have team and a project, uh, and hopefully are starting to think about it. Uh, as we move forward, we're going to be more explicit in kind of what exactly uh, documents we want to get from you. Uh, but please uh, come to office hours, ask questions uh, about this. Questions so far? No questions, excellent. Okay, and we're recording. Um, okay, so, so, so far this semester, we talked a lot about uh, expressivity of functions. And a lot of the things that we've done had to do with, as well, we wanna learn with a, a function class that is not so expressive, but that sometimes is impossible. So for example, uh, in this case, uh, data is not linearly separable in one dimension. If you insist on using a specific class of functions, of course, you can separate it with this very expressive class of function, but the solution that we've chosen so far has been to uh, basically transform the data into a more expressive representation. So instead of one dimension, we move to two dimension, and now we can use a simpler class of functions to do it. And we've actually talked about a range of ways to do this. And today, one way to think about what we're gonna do when we move to neural network is as another way of doing it, where you can think about multi-layer networks that really are designed to overcome this uh, computational expressivity limitation with a single uh, threshold element. So when we talked about a, th a single linear unit, we had this input XIs here, we had a set of weights that we summed up, and then we had a threshold gate, a decision function. So we computed the sign of this linear threshold function. Today, we're gonna to talk about putting this, uh, stacking this one on top of the other, so that we're gonna have input as here, we have the output units here are gonna be a hidden layer, and perhaps we're gonna have multiple hidden layers stacked, and then we're gonna reach the output. And you can, in some sense, think about all this bottom part of the network as a feature extraction step, if you want, learning more expressive representation so that the top linear level is doing what we you have been doing with perceptron or stochastic gradient descent and so on. Um, so, so just a little bit about history of where we are now. We are now in maybe the third wave of uh, the success 
or lack of, of neural networks. It started many years ago uh, by neuroscientists. Uh, and the first observation, the first important observation that uh, McCulloch and Pitts have made is that they show that linear threshold units can compute logical functions because after all, we want to be able to compute these kind of functions. And you have already seen that, how to compute an AND or an OR or a NOT using linear threshold function, right? So this is one of the kind of simple exercise that we've done before. You, you have two inputs and you want to compute the end of them. You take, say, threshold one for both of them with a threshold of one and a half, and you will get an end gate, which I show here, just by computing the linear sum minus the threshold. And the same thing you can do with or or not. And we've even shown it for slightly more expressive gates like M out of N. These are all linear units, and it all comes from this work that was done, uh, well, eight years ago now. Uh, but of course, they've already showed that <clears throat> some Boolean function cannot be computed with a linear threshold unit, like XOR, where, where we want, say, the black units here to be positive example and the white to be negative examples. And in order to do this, you have to incorporate more units. We have to basically have uh, more expressivity that we can achieve with two layered uh, units. Now, you have to uh, be careful about it because if all I have here is just a linear unit, that is uh, H3 is just a linear sum of I1 and I2, H4 is a linear sum of I1 and I2, and O is a linear sum of H3 and H4, I'm not going to add expressivity because linear sum of linear sum stays as a linear sum. So it's essential for us to add this nonlinearity using the threshold unit. So it's important that we put this gate here um, in order to really add expressivity. Um, and that's really what we're going to do here. So the idea is to stack several layers of threshold elements. And it's really important that we understand that it's the threshold is essential here because it adds the nonlinearity. Otherwise, everything is going to be linear. Uh, each layer is using the output of the previous layer as input. That's what we're doing. Um, and with that, it can be shown, and I'm going to comment about it a little bit later, that multi-layer network can represent arbitrary functions. Um, so it's as expressive as you want. And of course, the question is, how can we learn these uh, uh, methods? And uh, it used to be thought difficult. But already in the 1970s, people developed an algorithm. And the key algorithm that we're going to talk about today really goes back to 1970 or so. Uh, and this is the backpropagation algorithm. So before we get there, uh, let's organize our notations a little bit. So neural network are going to be functions from X to Y, where X could be either a set of Booleans or real valued function, uh, var variables. And Y could be thought about as either discrete Y or um, it's going to be the discrete 0, 1 or uh, the uh, the interval from zero to one. Um, in general, we're going to use it to approximate real valued or discrete values function. Uh, and if we put multiple units at the end, also vector valued uh, target functions. And this is really what we're going to have. So uh, we have two input units in this case, I1 and I2. We have two hidden units, H3 and H4. And we have an output uh, unit H5. Uh, and we have threshold elements in each one of these. So H3 is just the sign of W13 times I1 plus W23 uh, times I2 minus T3, which is here. Similarly, for T4, 
for H4, which is the sum of I1 times this weight, I2 times this weight, minus T4, and the same for T5, which is the linear sum of H3 times this weight, plus H4 times this weight minus T5. So, and that, that means that we have a lot of trainable parameters here. So the, this, this network is defined by the input, which is given to us, and these four plus two weights, and these three thresholds. So these are the parameters that eventually we want to learn as a way to define this function. Okay, so um, we talked about uh, general purpose supervised learning algorithms last time when we talked about ensemble methods. Uh, and neural network is also one of the most effective general purpose supervised learning methods known. Uh, the most kind of hot these days because everyone is talking about neural networks. Uh, and as I said at the beginning of the class, everything that we do here, we have to take with a little bit of grain of salt uh, because it has a lot of advantages, but some disadvantages that we have to account for um, when we think about it. But today we're gonna to talk about how it works um, and what we know about it. So uh, the representation is relatively simple and the important thing is how do we learn? So most of today we're gonna to spend on introducing the backpropagation algorithm uh, that really is the key workhorse of neural network. All the architectures uh, use essentially a backpropagation algorithm as a way uh, to learn the, um, the parameters of the network. Okay, so um, it's called neural network because people was, were hoping uh, or were inspired by biological neural network systems. Really uh, quite a major, a big gap between biological neural networks and neural networks, but nevertheless, that's the name. Um, and as I said, we are kind of in the third wave of interest in neural network. The first one started with McCulloch and Pete, went all the way to uh, Rosenblatt's perceptron and was killed uh, in the 70s. It came back up uh, in the 80s uh, with a series of book that is called uh, PDP, the PDP books. Uh, and this is actually in fact the first time where uh, the back propagation algorithm was published, died down in the 90s and came back about 10 years ago, really with the emergence of better architecture uh, that allows us to uh, use a lot of data in a better way, something that wasn't possible before, uh, really architecture and today GPUs and TPUs is the key thing that facilitated this, this current revolution. And of course, a lot more data uh, that we have today. Um, Okay, so, so one interesting perspective that is becoming more and more important when we think about neural network today, and you'll see it also next time, is that we used to think about neural network mostly as a function approximator. So it's a good way to learn expressive functions. In the last, let's say 10 or maybe more years, uh, and definitely more and more in the last very few years, People are thinking more uh, in, about neural network as uh, a better representation. So going back to the view that I started today with where we actually wanna learn a simple function at the top of the network, but we need to be able to learn good representation for the data. So more and more we are focusing today in the learning community on viewing the neural network as inducing a good intermediate representation for the data, and then we learn on top of it. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do in the next uh, two lectures um, is really uh, introduce a few of the basic architectures and the learning algorithm, 
and some examples for applications, and you're going to play with it um, in the homework uh, that is coming out today, and many of you, I assume, will also play with it in, the, in your projects. Questions so far? No questions. Okay, so again, the basic unit is, is this uh, linear threshold unit that you all know and love. We talked about, uh, in fact, a lot of this semester where we have this dot product of input with a weight vector minus a threshold, and then we take the sign. And this, this sign is giving us the nonlinearity that is so important for expressivity. However, what is missing about this is that it's not differentiable. And if we want to stack multiple units, one on top of the other, and be able to propagate error using uh, gradient descent, as we've done in almost all the algorithms so far, then the non-differentiability of this gate is not is a problem. So we're going to change this threshold to be a continuous function. And we're going to use instead this function, which is called the sigmoid function. So if x is the output of the network, the sum that we get here, then we're going to use the function 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x, which is called the sigmoid function or the logistic function as uh, as our output unit. So this behaves almost like a threshold, just a smoother threshold. It ranges between zero and one, also called sometimes a squashing function. Uh, and this will allow us to differentiate and therefore, as you will see, to propagate error. Now, of course, uh, it's not the only way to do this. It's only the, not the only gating function that you can use here. I'm going to mention a few later, and you will see as you play with uh, with practical architecture that sometimes you want to use other getting function, but all of them will behave in a similar way uh, to this one. The idea is that it's going to be differentiable uh, and allow us to uh, propagate error. Okay, so uh, I'm going to denote by net j uh, this, this linear sum, sum of uh, xi times wij. So weights that go from i to j, as you can see here. Um, and uh, then therefore the output is going to be denoted as oj, which is the sigmoid of net j, which is one over one plus e, to minus this output here, net j minus tj. So this replaces the x that I put here in the graph. Um, okay, so going back to the reason we are doing everything, everything has to do with representational power. We know that any Boolean function can be represented by a two layer network. Uh, essentially, we have an end or uh, graph if you want, and it's very expressive. Uh, any bounded continuous function can be approximated uh, with a two layer network. And if we want to approximate any function, not only bounded, we can do it with three layer networks. Um, so, so this has been known for probably 50 years now. Um, and uh, really is the reason we want to use this uh, this function. So, so just to summarize where we are so far, we talked about, we're talking about neural networks uh, that allows us to make prediction by basically given an input here. Um, oh, this is actually wrong the way it's written. Uh, input should be at the bottom. We propagate input by computing the output at each layer and giving it an input to the next layer. Uh, in order to specify the neural network, we need the weights and the threshold units. Um, and the fact that we can do this today relatively quickly really has to do with uh, parallelism. 
the fact that we can compute a lot of this uh, in parallel. Okay, so that that is summary of where we were so far, and and what we where we want to get is to think about how to train a neural network. Uh, and again, going a little bit to the history, as I said, the first round or the first wave of uh, neural network already started with suggesting learning rules. Uh, the first one was a HEB rule that suggested that if two units are both active or firing, uh, if, you, if you think about real neurons, then the weights between them should increase. And he suggested the way to formulate this, where OJ and OI are outputs of network, R is a learning rate, and this is how the new weight is gonna be updated. Um, and based on this, Rosenblatt, that you already know and love, suggested uh, this perceptron update rule. In words, he said that when a target output value is provided for a single neuron with fixed input, it can incrementally change weights and learn to produce the output using the perceptron learning rule. So uh, this led him to the development of the perceptron learning algorithm, proving uh, that it's actually a very good learning algorithm and you now know all about it. You also know something that wasn't known at that time, that really the perceptron learning algorithm is a, is a gradient descent algorithm. So if you define a loss function appropriately, and you all know how to do this, um, you can view this uh, learning rule that was developed by a neuroscientist in the 50s as a stochastic gradient descent uh, update rule. Okay, but now we want to do more than that. We want to deal with this two uh, layer, two unit neural network or more than that. And the question is, and we have a lot more parameters. And the question is, how do we do that? Uh, and the answer is really the same principle is going to guide us. So we are still going to use the same gradient descent algorithm. Uh, we're going to have a loss function or an error function that is going to be a function of the weights. Uh, given a fixed set of examples, we're going to try to uh, go down the gradient of this network. That is, we want to try to update the weight, the weights, so that we minimize the error of this function. Now, this is exactly the same picture that we showed when we talked about uh, gradient descent in the linear case. Uh, now it's going to be a little bit more difficult, but conceptually the same thing. Again, we have to define uh, a loss function, an error function. And I'm going to use the same error function that we started with. Uh, this is the LMS sum of squares of error. So TKD minus OKD square sum over all Ks and sum over all the data. This is going to be the error function. Um, where again, D is the data the examples and case the set of uh, output units. So that's what we've done before. And that's what we wanna be able to generalize now uh, to the general case. So before again, we use the derivative of the error relative to the weights in order to decide how to update each weight. Uh, and remember also that we moved from this gradient descent to a stochastic gradient descent algorithm. So we didn't want every time to touch all the data points. We didn't want this sum here. And instead we basically gave it uh, one example at a time and update the weights uh, this way. Okay, so uh, because you already know uh, gradient descent, you already know how to learn the top layer. It's just a linear unit. So given feedback uh, at the top layer and the activation at this layer, 
you can use the perceptron update rule or more generally the, the stochastic gradient descent update rule to update these weights here at the top, right? So this upper layer network. The problem is what do I do with these weights at the bottom here and maybe multiple layers like this and how do I uh, update that given that they do not get direct feedback uh, from these external nodes. Uh, and that's what we want to deal with. Um, so the solution is, uh, if all the activation functions in this network are differentiable, then the output of the uh, unit is also differentiable as a function of each one of the weights. Um, and, uh, Therefore, I can actually propagate uh, error to these lower units. Um, we can evaluate the derivatives of the error with respect to the weights and use this derivative as a way to update the, uh, these weights. And this, this algorithm is, uh, is what is gonna be called uh, backpropagation. So, so the basic of what we are doing here is a little bit of calculus. And this uh, brings me to my first question today. So I want to, I know that you all know this. I want you to think about it and bring it to the top of your head. Um, what is the chain rule for differentiating a composite function? So I have this function f of g of x, and I want to know what is d uh, to dx. So what I'd like you to do is to think about it and write down this uh, chain rule of differentiation. Okay, so many of you have this. Let's see uh, what you think. Okay, so I chose this worldly representation here. Let's see if that, uh, we get a lot of things. I'm hoping that the winning one is gonna be the right one. We're not winning yet. Okay, now we see something that makes sense in the middle, but it's not exactly right. Okay, so that means you all need to uh, rethink your calculus again, or many of you. Okay, that's what I wanted to see, right? So, and I'm writing it here in two ways. You can either think about it as f prime of g of x times g prime of x. So it's a chain rule, right? So, or another way of saying it, df to dx is df to dg times dg to dx. So essentially, if f if is a function of x through g, I'm first differentiating f relative to g and then differentiating g relative to x. And if the chain is longer, I can keep on uh, differentiating this, this way. Uh, so, so remember this because we're gonna use this many times in the next half an hour. Um, and, and let's uh, get the notation that we're gonna use here, right? So, so again, I'm, I'm kind of uh, 
reminding you of this. So, so I have a function here, in this case, z is a function of y, and I'm going to care about dz to dy, the derivative of z relative to y, that I'm going to show this with this uh, arrow here. Um, that basically means that the information flows from y to z. z is a function of y. Uh, and I'm going to co compute the derivative of z uh, relative to y. So if z is 2y squared, you should be able to compute dz to dy in this case. Um, OK, but uh, if z is a function of y and y is a function of x, then z is also a function of x, and I want to be able to compute. And of course, given x, I should be able to compute y. And then given y, I should be able to compute z. So that's the way the information goes upward. This is the way prediction is going to go in the neural network. But when I want to compute the impact of x on z, I want to compute the derivative z dz dx, which is going to be dz dy times dy dx, which is exactly the rule uh, I was asking about before. Um, any question about this? Okay, hopefully this rings a bell. And we're going to use these facts to derive the details of this backpropagation algorithm, um, which is really, as I said, the basic algorithm we care about in neural network. Z is going to be the loss function here at the top. And we need to know how to differentiate it relative to things uh, at the bottom of this network. Um, in all cases, the intermediate nodes are going to use the logistic function. Uh, and we need to know how to differentiate this, it too. Now, of course, things are going to be slightly more complicated because Z is going to get input for multiple Y's, right? So Z is going to be the linear sum of Y1 times something plus Y2 times something. But differentiation is a linear operator. And therefore, I can say that DZ to the X is the sum of, if I go through this route, dz dy1 times t, dy1 to dx plus dz dy2 plus dy2 to dx. Uh, and of course, if I have more like this, I can sum more. So dz do, to dx is going to be the linear sum over all the hidden unit of dz dyi dyi dx. So that's basically just a um, chain rule. I haven't done anything. Now this is correct here. The input is at the bottom. I have some hidden layer and I can compute if I give, give an input and I have all the weights here, I can compute the values of the hidden layer and therefore the output. Uh, but I care about going backwards. Uh, so gradient descent is going to be used to change the weights in the direction of the gradient so that I can minimize the error function that I see here, right? Exactly the same story that we've seen before, right? So I want to minimize the error and I'm going to change the weight going down this slope uh, so that I reach a minimal value of the error. And we're going to use the chain rule for, for doing it uh, to calculate the weights of intermediate weights uh, here in this network. For example, DE to the WIJ, where WIJ is going to be one of the weights here. Uh, we are also going to use uh, memoization just as, as a way to remember uh, uh, intermediate results of weight updates so that we can do this faster. Okay, so essentially the way the algorithm is going to work is just like stochastic gradient descent, I'm going to loop over instances, over examples. First of all, we're going to do the forward step, right? So given an example, I'm going to put it here in the input and propagate it up. Once we get up, we compute the error and take the backward step. So in the forward step, given input, make predictions layer by layer, starting from the first layer. 
Uh, and similarly, uh, in the backward step, we're going to do the same thing and layer by layer from top down, we're going to calculate the, the error, first of the output layer, and then layer by layer, compute the errors uh, until we get to this, to updating the bottom layer weights. Okay, so just to summarize where we are now, uh, we have a forward step, the goal of which is just to make predictions. Yeah, that's kind of the standard way that we are propagating information. The backward step is, uh, its goal is to update the weights given the error that I observe here at the output layer. Um, and the chain rule is basically used as a way to compute the gradient of intermediate level. We didn't need it when we computed the gradient at the top layer, as we did in stochastic gradient descent. But if we want to compute the update rule uh, for the intermediate layers, I need to be able to use the chain rule uh, and compute the weights this way. And hopefully big propagation would be efficient or relatively efficient because it can be parallelized. Okay. So now to the key step of update, updating the rules. Any questions so far? Okay, that's the, the basic unit we're talking about. And again, I wanna remind you the notation here. I'm gonna use net J uh, as the linear sum of all the weights coming into the Jth unit. So it's Wij where i, j are weights from i to j times x, i. And by o, j, I'm going to use, I'm going to denote the sigmoid value of this. So it's 1 over 1 plus e to the minus net j minus tj, where t is the threshold. Um, now, as I mentioned before, uh, we can use other functions here, not only the sigmoid function. You're gonna see later on tan h, uh, which is essentially the same function, only that sigmoid ranges from zero to one and tan h ranges from minus one to one. Or real u, which is another function that is in fact not bounded. So it's zero at the beginning and then goes linearly up. And sometimes you wanna use this, but uh, in any case, we have some gating function that makes this uh, nonlinear. And of course, we can also use other loss functions as we've done in this simple linear threshold unit stochastic gradient descent. I'm gonna use here LMS, but you will see later on and in your homework that other loss functions are, are possible and, and are quite useful. Uh, but conceptually, everything is the same thing, right? You were just differentiating different functions. Okay, so uh, the weights are gonna be updated incrementally and the error, because we, I'm running really a stochastic uh, algorithm is computed per example. So this is gonna be my error, TK minus output minus OK square sum over all the units. Um, okay, so um, we know that Wij, which I'm showing here, influences Oj only through this linear sum, right? And therefore I can figure out uh, the derivative of the error Ed relative to Wij. It's basically this and I'm using chain rule, right? So the error DED to DWJ, WIJ is DED, DOJ, DOJ, D net J, D net J, DWIJ, right? So I have three steps of this computation. I'm using WJ, IJ to compute net J. This is just this linear sum, I'm using net j to compute oj via the sigmoid function here. And then I'm using doj to compute the error using this function here, right? So I have three functions and therefore my 
uh, my chain rule has three steps. Uh, and so how do I do it? I have these three functions. Let's differentiate these three functions. The first one is this error function. Uh, and we already know this is something that we've seen how to compute the DE to DOJ. It's basically this function. So what I get is the negative sign because of this of TI minus OI. Second function that I have is just this linear gate, right? So net J is the linear sum of the XIs with WIJ as coefficients and therefore D net J to DWIJ is just XI. These two things you've already seen before when we did stochastic gradient descent for linear units. The last step uh, that you haven't seen is the sigmoid. Uh, and in this case, I wanna differentiate OI, which is one over one plus E of this. Uh, and I'm just reminding you here, this is the more uh, challenging differentiation step here. The function that I'm differentiating is this, one over one plus E to the minus X. X here is this net J minus T. And the derivative of uh, sigma of X relative to X is this, sigma of X, one minus sigma of X. You can go home and check this, try it yourself. It requires just simple differentiation and a bit of algebra, and I will not prove this, but once you believe this, then I can write DOJ to D net J uh, as this function, right? E to the minus X, one plus E to the minus X all square, which can also be written as OI one minus OI, which is what's written here. Okay, so basically what I've done is I showed you the components of the chain rule. And therefore we can now compute the weight updates uh, of the units. And, and we're gonna start with the update un with the output units, uh, this one where we care about WIJ, which is here. And I'm gonna use the chain rule and just write this together. Just to remind you what I've done here, this is DE to DOJ. To D -O -J, uh, because this is the error function. This is DOJ to D net J. This is the hard part, as I mentioned, and it because I'm differentiating uh, this one over one plus E to the minus X. And the third part is D net J to DWIJ, which is XI because I'm just differentiating this linear sum. Questions? Okay, so that's that's the, the basic uh, rule that we have to know. And now I'm gonna name, um, so, so therefore the, the delta WIJ is just a learning rate R times this gradient, right? Uh, I'm gonna call this part, the middle part here, delta J. Um, and therefore, which, which is defined this way. And you will see in many places that back propagation is, is written as the delta rule. The update rule in back propagation is called the delta rule. And that's the reason because we, ca we call this intermediate uh, update step delta. Uh, A question is, would this get more complicated with a four layer network? Uh, not really, because we invented this notation of Delta here, it will not get more complicated. We're gonna do basically the same thing only multiple times as we will see in a second. So, so this is the key component because every gate here, it doesn't matter whether it's the top unit or the fourth unit or the 17th unit sometimes, the 17th hidden layer, uh, each layer is just a linear unit with 
uh, the sigmoid at the top of it. So every layer behaves this way and we just need to figure out how to propagate the error. Uh, and this is where the delta, uh, remembering this delta is going to help us. So let's let's move on and see. So we talked about here uh, about the output unit, and now we're going to move to the hidden units. So again, when we talk about this WIJ, we know that WIJ influences the output only through all the units whose direct input includes J, right? So so if this is a node from W from I to J, uh, it only influences J through the parents of J, if you want, right? So all those units that are linked to uh, to J here. So that's what I care about, right? So I care about if I want to know how to update WIJ, I need to think about J and the parents of J that I show here in this picture. So the error DED to DWIJ is going to be again DED to DNetJ, DNetJ to DWJ, and now I can keep on working. Uh, I already know that uh, I kept this. I know that DNetJ to DWJ is just XI, right? It's just a linear sum, just like before. Uh, but I need to sum, when I compute DED to DNetJ, I need to do DED to DNetK, DNetK to DNetJ over all the parents of J, right? So I want to compute DED to the uh, net J here, and I'm going to do it by summing over all the Ks that are the parents of J. which you can see here from this uh, picture. Now Delta comes to help us because we've already seen what is DED to D net K. It's just minus Delta K, which we've denoted before times this component. So this is just this and that's it. So Let's summarize where we are when we're talking about hidden units. WIJ influences the output only through all the units whose direct input include J, so the parents of J here, and therefore differentiating the error relative to WIJ is going to be just a sum over all the parents of J, delta K, K is the parent of J, and we already defined what is the delta K, D net K to D net J times XI. Um, and we can continue, right? So I just copied the delta K here. Uh, what is D net K to D net J? It's D net K to the OJ, D OJ to D net K. I kept the XI here, right? And we've already computed that. So D net K to D O J um, is just uh, this W. And this is the sigmoid unit, right? That we've seen before. So the differentiation, the derivative is just this. So again, this is just the W and this is the sigmoid unit. Okay, let, let me just stop here and make sure that we understand. Uh, again, what helps us, this, is this part is exactly what we've done for the units before, for the output unit before. And what I kept here is just the delta K, which I've defined before, and that allows me to do the propagation, right? So I remember that this comes from the parents, from one layer above me. Okay, uh, so now let's plug this in to the, to how do, how do we update? Uh, so, so here we computed uh, the error and now I'm gonna plug this in to the update rule. So how do I change WIJ learning rate times the uh, 
rule that I developed previously here, which is this. I can take this OJ, one minus OJ outside uh, the linear sum because the sum is over the parents of J. And that's what I have here, the sum over the parents of J of the delta K, W, J, K. So again, I'm talking about uh, the weight from I to J here, and I'm writing it in terms of something that has to do with OJ, with the output here, and something that comes from all the parents here. This is what is being propagated to me from the top of the network times the input Xi, right? So these are the three components. The behavior of J, what comes up, what comes to me from above me being back propagated from the parents and the input Xi. That's it. And again, we already uh, denoted this, if you want, delta J, which is um, the sum uh, of what we've done here. So uh, where delta J is the output at J times the components that come from the parents of J. Okay, so, so essentially uh, we uh, completed uh, the backpropagation algorithm. So I just wanna remind you that, you know, this component here, this part with Xi and with one W was just what we've done for a linear unit. What we are replacing here is this middle component that comes as the propagation of error from the parents. And we're gonna do this one step at a time, right? So first determine the error for the update unit and then back propagate this error layer by layer through the network, changing the weights uh, in each layer as a function of what's being propagated from the top. Question. Uh, Yes, this should be, oh, thanks. This should be Xi here, not Xij. Thanks for the comment, yeah. Uh, I'll fix later. Uh, other questions? Um, yeah, I have one quick question. So uh, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out uh, D net J, D W I J, how does that equal Xi? So what is net J? Let's just go a uh, couple of slides back. Sorry, I've been kind this of thinking net, about it. <laughs> yeah, this, this is net J, right? So net J is just the linear sum of the Xi. So, so, so think about you're sitting on this Jth node here. What is net J? It's just the linear sum of all the Xi's below it. Okay. With coefficient W A J. So what is the derivative of net j relative to w i j, everything disappears except for the x i. Uh, okay, yep, all right, got so it. That, that's exactly the step that we've done also uh, in, in stochastic gradient descent originally, right? So you differentiate this linear sum relative to w i j, uh, only x i remains. Makes sense, right? thank you. Um, Okay, so really the key difference that is happening now is, um, okay, I can show this again. So we have uh, D net to DW, T to DO, sorry, which is just the weight. DO to D net, which is the sigmoid function derivative, which I showed before, the derivative of one over one plus e to the minus X which I, I ask you to believe that that's the de derivative. And then we have the Xi, uh, which came from the question that you just asked. And it's exactly the same. All these components are exactly as we had before. The only thing that remains is this Delta K that we move 
from that we back propagated from the parents. That's the key difference that we have. So this component we have for the linear unit, this component we had for the linear unit, and this component now becomes more complicated because I have to sum over everything above J, all the parents of J. And recursively only, because I just care about one step, uh, this delta K already takes care of everything above K. Uh, recursively. So, so again, it's a recursive algorithm where I first determine the error of the output unit, and then step by step, we propagate the error layer, uh, the error layer by layer through the network. Uh, let, let's summarize. So, uh, we have a fully connected, in this case, three layer network, uh, but the same is going to work for 17 layer network conceptually there's going to be some issues that we're going to discuss uh, next time in terms of computational issues or numerical issues but not in terms of algorithm uh, i'm going to initialize the weight randomly let's say uh, and then i'm going to uh, train in the following way i'm taking one example at a time uh, and I'm producing prediction and errors, and I'm going to stop whenever my error, uh, say, is below some epsilon, predetermined epsilon, or some other stopping criteria. You can think about it, and, and we're going to mention a few later. But this is uh, conceptually the same thing as, as you would do with any learning algorithm. How do we train? Given the example, I first compute the network output. Basically, I forward propagate the example through the network. And then I compute the error. Uh, once I compute the error, I can compute this, this delta. Uh, remember, this is uh, TK minus OK times OK, 1 minus OK, right? That, that's, that's how we define the delta term. And now for each output unit, we sum um, this delta J this way. So, so what is the uh, delta J? It's the output determined by the output of, uh, OJ, of J, OJ1 minus OJ, times this sum over all the parents of J. And this gives me the error term for WIJ, right? WIJ is the uh, is the weight leading uh, from I to J, right? So I'm talking about this WIJ now, updating it. So it's basically this delta J, which I computed here, times the input XI. And now this can be also in the middle of the network. XI will be then uh, the input through WIJ to J. Um, and that's it. Basically, I'm updating WIJ, and then we can keep on going uh, this way. Questions? Okay, so, so essentially, the same algorithm works uh, for any number of uh, linear units or hidden layers that you have, uh, because we just took any WIJ in the middle here and wrote the rule as a function of what's coming here in the I and the parent of J, which we call the Ks, right? And any uh, WIJ is gonna be updated in exactly the same way using this Delta J, and that's as I said, why this backpropagation algorithm is sometimes called the Delta Rule. Okay, so uh, if you want to play with it, uh, this is one of the many demos that you can go and play with. I'm not going to spend uh, time on it now, but you can define, the, uh, you know, change the architecture of the network, change the loss function. Uh, change the gate function, I think, also, and, and just uh, see what happens. 
Uh, okay. That's what we've done so far, right? So we, we talked about a feed forward network, or sometimes it's called multi-layer perceptron, MLP, just because each uh, function here in the middle, Y3 as a function of these guys, or this hidden layer as a function of these guys, or this hidden node as a function of the Xs, each one of them can be thought about the perceptron, only that we are stacking them one on top of the other. And you can also see that the update rule is very similar to a perceptron rule. It's essentially driven by a stochastic gradient descent rule, only that unlike the output layer where the error comes directly because you see an observation and you have your own prediction and you look at the difference between the observation, uh, the, the Y that comes from the observation and your output, in the middle, you've propagated some error signals and you look at the difference between what you produce here and the error that is being propagated. So, and that's the reason we call this a multi-layer perceptron. So, so just to get used to the notation that you'll see uh, in a few places, notice that, um, okay, so, so I have input X in RM, this is my dimensionality M, and I want to have output Y in Rn, N and M are different, you know, could be different. Uh, M is the dimensionality of my input, N is the number of output units I want to produce. And in the middle, I can have any number of hidden layers, in this case, D1 here and D2 here. And this is how you define the architecture, right? So. Uh, everything I said so far is completely independent of the architecture. It doesn't matter how many hidden uh, layers you have, and it doesn't matter how many hidden units you have in each layer. Um, now, notation-wise, it's, it's important to realize that you can use, and you will see it uh, being used, matrix notation, right? Because essentially, all the weights that go into a single unit here right, form this vector, W11, W21, W31, W41. Uh, and all the layers that constitute this first level of the network constitute uh, a matrix, right? If you look at, at uh, these are all the ways that coming out for w, from W1, you can see it here. And all together, all these are going to be all this matrix. And the same thing is going to happen for each one of the layers. So you could think about what's happening here is uh, matrix multiplication. So essentially computing or making the prediction here is a matrix multiplication or repeated matrix multiplication operation. Uh, again, this is just something uh, notational convenience that, that you need to get used to. Uh, okay, summarizing this again uh, and, and uh, asking for questions. Now, wh what I've done here, I've done it for one loss function, uh, the LMS loss function that you can see here. Um, in practice, you're gonna use other loss functions. And as I said, also other gating functions instead of sigmoid or in addition to sigmoid, different architecture will adopt different uh, gating functions for various reasons. Um, and, and in many cases, you will no longer need to compute the update rule yourselves because there are auto differentiation packages that you will use. Uh, and in fact, in your homework, this is what you're gonna use. You're gonna use one of the packages that uh, you basically define the loss functions and differentiation is done for you. You still need to understand what's happening inside this box. And hopefully that gave you a little bit uh, of insight here. Okay, so, so a lot of important comments here uh, to deal with. So, so first of all, uh, unlike what we've done when we talked about a single uh, linear threshold unit, in general, neural networks um, provide non-convex functions, multiple local minima, and there's no guarantee of convergence. 
So um, you're going to train it in many cases on a lot of data. Uh, and you will have to train it for many epochs. One of the big secrets of neural networks is that uh, it actually takes a long time to compute. Um, uh, both evaluation and, of course, even more so training uh, could take hours. Uh, you have to think about uh, termination, and termination can be a function of fixed number of epochs. I'm not going to train more than 10 epochs. Uh, threshold on training set errors. Uh, observing the change in the errors and identifying when there's no decrease or no significant decrease in error, then you can stop. Or increased error on validation set. So all these are standard methods that you've seen before. Uh, the key thing to, uh, that is different is this notion of avoiding local minima. And in many, many cases, you will uh, run several trials with different random initial weights. Um, and, and then you will uh, either average or do majority or, uh, or vote somehow uh, as a way to avoid local minima. Um, okay, so one of the key issues, she, she, key issues to discuss is overtraining prevention. Now, again, we've seen this before when we talked about decision trees, when we talked about uh, not so much about linear threshold units because they don't overfit as much, but there too. Um, and, and we have to deal with overfitting. So uh, some of the ways that I'm going to describe here are standard, right? So running, uh, we know that running too many epochs or using a neural network that is too expressive, too many hidden layers or too many hidden nodes in a layer is going to lead to an overfit, uh, overfitting. Exactly the same issues that we talked about before, it's too expressive. So one key way is to keep held out validation set and test accuracy after every epoch and control overfitting this way. Uh, this could lead to early stopping, right? So um, you're gonna maintain weights for the best performing network on the validation set. And once you start seeing decrease in vali on validation set, you're gonna stop and that's it. Uh, and again, the standard way of avoiding losing training data to validation, you can run cross-validation, 10-fold cross-validation or five-fold cross-validation uh, to determine uh, the average number of epochs that you want to run uh, and, and tune uh, this way. So, um, so these are, as I said, standard ways to uh, avoid overfitting and a few others. Hidden units. Uh, so, um, the standard way of expressivity, if you don't have enough hidden units, you may lose because you're not expressive enough. If you have too many hidden units, it can lead to overfitting. So the standard cost validation method that we have seen before are gonna apply here too. Um, another approach that we that allows to prevent uh, overfitting is weight decay, uh, which basically means that you're gonna decrease weights with time uh, after every epoch. Um, smaller weights means that you have less complex function. Remember that when we talked about support vector machines, we talked about the size of the weight vector uh, as a regularization parameter, right? Because if you have smaller weights or some of them will disappear altogether, become zero, it means that you have a less expressive hypothesis. Uh, and, and again, uh, regularization is, is a notion also in neural networks. Uh, in addition to these, uh, there are some ways that were developed specifically for neural networks, and I'm going to mention one of them, the key one now, uh, and that is what is called dropout. So the idea here is that as you train, 
you uh, decide whether to just randomly delete some of the hidden units. So with some probability P, you're gonna delete one hidden unit. Um, and this can show, can, can be shown to actually help generalization. It's exactly the same notion of uh, regularization. Uh, here there is, th these are results uh, from experiments. They show here fine tuning without dropout and fine tuning with dropout. And you can see that from the same point here, if you do dropout, you keep on generalizing. If you don't use dropout, you start uh, overfitting. Uh, and this has been one of the key ways. In fact, all the uh, packages that you're going to use are going to already use a dropout training and allow you to, to tune this. Um, so you can do this both for hidden unit. You can also do this for input units. And with some random probability, drop some of the input units and allow your model to learn the function with only partial input. Uh, has a very similar effect to, to drop out uh, hidden units. Uh, okay. Summarizing and, and questions. Okay, so what we've done today is uh, basically talked about the, the key algorithm in neural network. Almost everything that we're gonna do uh, next time and that you're gonna do in the homework and, and some of you in your project is gonna be basically uh, variations of backpropagations uh, because that's the only way we know to kind of propagate back errors. Basically, you do gradient descent and you figure out how to send it back to, to hidden layers. Um, one other thing that I mentioned, and it will become clearer next time, uh, is that we no longer think about neural network only as a global approximator. It's, we don't only care about the output. We begin to care more about what's inside these hidden layers, what representations, uh, or what, what is, if you want, the meaning of the representation here. Uh, and some of the more advanced algorithm and more advanced architecture really focus on this. Uh, next time we're gonna talk about uh, two important steps, convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks and some very recent advances uh, uh, as a function of these. Uh, and I wanna remind you again that a programming or Pythoning with uh, neural network is gonna be covered in the recitations. And we're gonna give a few pointers uh, to some tutorials. You will need that for the homework uh, and the projects. Questions? Okay, if there are no questions, we're gonna stop here and continue next time with uh, CNNs and RNNs uh, and a few other advanced architectures. Okay, see you Wednesday then. Thank you. Thank you.